joining today. It's really great to see so many familiar faces on the screen. I look forward to the day when we can do our partner meetings in person again. Um, I think many of you are, whoops, let's see if I can get the slides to work. There we go. So many of you have been on our Zoom webinars. You've been through a lot of Zoom over the last year. We're kind of working our way to the end of Zoom, but I just do the regular Zoom tips. All of you were muted when you came in. You can unmute using the microphone button on the bottom of your screen. You can choose to have your video on. It's nice to see your faces, but if you don't want to have your video on today, that is just fine, and you can turn your video off. We can see we've got 36 folks on the call today. You can use that participants button to find the little raise hand piece. You can also unmute yourself if you have a question and you can use the chat feature. And we're gonna spend a little bit of time on the chat feature today and I'll go over that in a minute. And then you can either choose the gallery view to see everyone who's on the call today or just be looking at whoever's speaking. We are recording today's call and we're doing that so that we make sure that anyone who wasn't able to join us today is able to hear about the presentation. So thanks again for joining us today. All right, thank you again for joining us today. Just a welcome to everyone. This is APIP Spring Partner Meeting and I am Tamara Van Ryan, the manager of the Adirondack Park Invasive Plant Program. So I'm just delighted that you're here today. I hope you all had a safe winter and that you are enjoying signs of spring wherever you are. It was wonderful to have so many of you participate in our February roundtables, and we have had a lot of follow up with many of you as we've been busy putting together our plans for this summer. And I'm so excited that we get to share some of that with you today. It's going to be a fast paced agenda. We have a lot of short sections and a lot of topics, and we want to make sure that we get through all of those in order to have time for our feature presentation on environmental DNA for invasive species detection. And I can't wait to hear what our presenters have to say about that today. So we're not doing our regular formal partner updates in order to have enough time for our feature presentation, but I hope that you'll all actively engage today. We're gonna to use the chat feature a lot. So again, thanks for Jackie for starting that up. And I'd love you all to share your favorite signs of spring that you're seeing out there right now. And we can start using the chat. So uh, please share some of your favorite signs of spring. And with that, I'm going to talk a little bit briefly about APIP's overall work plan for the summer based on a lot of what we heard from you in February. And then we'll turn it over and get started with our volunteer update. So again, I just I think you know many of us on the APIP team on the program manager. Becca Bernacki is not able to join us today. She's our terrestrial coordinator, but we have Emily Beldinen, our education and outreach coordinator, and Zach Simic, our conservation and GIS analyst. You'll hear from both of them today. Adelia Baker is on the line, and Adelia was our star seasonal steward last year, and we are just delighted that Adelia is going to be back on our team this summer. And we have a brand new member of our team as well, Brian Green, who just started a couple of weeks ago. Yay, we're clapping for Brian. Brian, you want to introduce yourself and say hi to some folks? Hi, everybody. I am thrilled to uh, be joining the APIP team as the Aquatic Invasive Species Coordinator. And I'm looking forward to getting to work with all of you to help protect our great Adirondack Lakes and going to try to build on the great foundation that Aaron and all the volunteers left behind. So I'm very excited for this opportunity. Great, and we're excited to have Brian on board and can't wait till Adelia starts and can't wait to get out and about and see many of you this summer as well. Um, so I'm, I'm loving those signs of spring. I love listening to the peepers out there and to the wood frogs. So thanks for all of those good thoughts as we're sitting here locked in front of Zoom, but we can at least be thinking about the outdoors. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about APIP summer work plan, but I'd love to hear from you all about what things you're excited about this summer. And I'll tell you again a little bit about what we're have what we have going on this summer. 
So uh, we're going to talk probably a lot today about our aquatic early detection network. And I see some of our key partners and volunteers on, on the call today. We'd never be able to do this without all of you out there as part of that network. We're really pleased to be contracting again with Adirondack Research to do our professional surveys this summer. They'll have a crew of six, uh, four of which will be mostly spending time in the Adirondacks, and they've got a lot of returning crew members, so that'll be great to have them out on the water this summer. Our terrestrial early detection work is going strong, and we've hired invasive plant control again. Uh, they, they'll be coming up and sending up a crew from the southeast up here to the Adirondacks. And Adelia will be back, and we have lots of volunteers out there. We'll talk briefly this morning about the Knotweed Management Partnership that we, that we helped with last year. And we'll, you're going to be hearing a lot from us about our volunteer and professional training series as we put those together. I did just want to make a note that all of our presentations and, and workshops this summer will still be on Zoom. While we'd love to see you out in the field, the Nature Conservancy is very cautious in its reopening plans. We also want to respect people who are not yet confident going out in large groups. So we'll be doing Zoom trainings this summer, but we may have an opportunity to see you out on boat launches, see you in the water, and see you in the field. Our volunteer and professional training series is going to launch in May 25th with a pesticide applicator training and also training for any transportation professionals. So if you are on a road crew or know people on road crews, please get that on your calendar. And we're putting together a really fun workshop for June 9th for the Invasive Species Awareness Week on paddling and we're teaming up with the Northern Forest Canoe Trail. That's going to be a really fun workshop. We've got a lot of research projects going on today. We're not going to be talking about all of those. Um, and we are also sub submitting a lot of data to IMAP invasives. And hopefully we will launch it by sometime this summer, a revision of our strategic plan. So you'll hear a lot about that as well. I did see a chat question come through about what our pro crews are doing. So Adirondack Research and our water crew, they do uh, uh, an early detection monitoring on about 40 lakes across the Adirondacks each summer. And you can see their full report on our website. And we'll talk a little bit more about it, Brian, will later today. And our invasive plant control contractors uh, travel the, uh, the Adirondacks, uh, all 6 million acres of them. They visit about 6,000 sites. Uh, they are doing control work on a variety of sites and tracking where invasives are. Again, their annual report is on our website, and we can send you some links in the chat to those reports. And with that, I think I'm going to turn it over to Emily Bell. All right, I think I'm controlling things now. All right, so I'm going to take a few minutes just to talk about uh, APIPs volunteer programs over this past year. Some of these may be familiar to you and two of them might actually be new to you. Um, and we're and on cue, my dog started barking. So please excuse me. Um, oh, some of my buttons changed up. So the first program I wanna talk about is new this past year and it's been an excellent partnership with um, one, two, three, four, five, five different organizations, including our separate, not including ourselves. It's a cross prism project, which is one of, uh, it's a first for APIP. Um, we've worked with IMAP Invasives, the Adirondack, oh, sorry, the Adirondack Mountain Club, the Cap Capital Region Invasive Species Management. Uh, sorry, the chat is actually blocking. I'm gonna disable this. Um, the Capital Region Invasive Species Management Prism, the Leaf. George Lands Conservancy, the New York State Hemlock Initiative, and IMAP Invasives to create this new, um, this new program where we are trying to create more transparency and get through a couple of hurdles to get folks to get out onto the landscape, adopt trails, and hunt for HWA or Hemlock Woolly Adelgid. So the focus of this region, or the focus region for this project was in the Lake George um, watershed, focusing on the outbreak that occurred or that was identified late last summer, which many of you are aware of. And we started this program out by recruiting um, volunteers through two different workshops where we had almost 175 
participants per come to these live workshops back in February and early March to learn all about what Hemlock Woolly Adelgid is, ecosystem impacts, um, hot button issues that are specific to the Adirondacks. And then the second workshop was a follow up on how to survey, how to get out onto the landscape and how to use this new tool that we developed um, that you're seeing here. So this was, this is a collection of priority trails collected um, different data layers and map layers and trail layers from all of our different partners in this that are mentioned below um, to get people out onto the landscape say, all right, I'm going to adopt this trail. I'm going to go do this survey that we learned about. And I'm going to go look to see if Hemlock Willie Dilgit is present or not present and then upload that data onto IMAP. Um, to be honest, I thought we would be knocking it out of the ballpark if we got 10 volunteers and people did 25 surveys. Um, but beyond my wildest expectations, this project really blew up. And that's thanks to so many partners working together, so many great people uh, telling other people about the education we had available and the importance of HWA. And so we had 26 trail adopters or volunteers. We had 102 trails adopted. So we started to, uh, Carolyn, who you're gonna hear from in a moment was at, towards the end was saying, I don't know if there are any more trails for me to adopt. If people haven't done them, maybe they could drop them and I'll go out and do it. Um, and we had 167 observations entered into IMAP Invasive. So along a trail, um, if you came across a group of hemlocks, uh, you would stop and do a survey. So one trail might have had multiple surveys on one, one section. So that's why we have more observations than trails adopted. And um, We've pulled people back from the field thus far um, because the HWA has entered its crawling stage. We don't want to inadvertently spread HWA around the Adirondacks as we promote citizen science to lessen its, its spread. Um, and so we're going to start this back up in October. Um, and without further, and, uh, and you will all be well aware of it when we, when we start promoting it again. We're really excited to get out there and this was the bad weather time, right? So I can't wait for the fall, like gorgeous days in October. Um, so without further ado, I actually want to have Carolyn. Carolyn, is it Sear? Is that how you say your last name? Yeah, I'm sorry. Perfect. Perfect. We've, only, yeah. we've only communicated via email. Um, so I'd love for Carolyn, one of our star volunteers to talk to you all right now. Um, I'm gonna calculate just how many surveys Carolyn did, but she, at least dozens, at least two to possibly three dozen trails she adopted. Um, she went out hours out of her way to go to special hot spots as we started to think, okay, it might be in this area, it might be in that area. Um, and not only this, she also recruited her own volunteers. So I would love to just hand it over to you, Carolyn, to let people know about your experience. Okay, and I'll thank go you on mute. All right, thanks very much and good morning, everybody. Um, this was a great opportunity for me to get involved with the HWA this late winter and spring. I had dabbled in some other citizen science projects over the years, um, aquatic invasive species back in the time where I would uh, print maps and mail them in by US Postal Service, frogs and salamanders, and I've worked with the Loon Conservation Group on their annual survey. Uh, but late this winter, it really was an alignment of the stars for me to get involved with this. I've loved hemlock trees since my childhood days of spending all my uh, available hours in the woods uh, down the street from my house under the hemlock trees. And uh, due to COVID, all winter long, I've been busy taking walks and cross-country skiing and snowshoeing. Um, but I still felt a need to get out of the house and do something meaningful. Um, in addition to that, my hesitation, honestly, was not the hemlock trees or wearing the micro spikes or, or finding the spots. It was the technology aspect. Because uh, here where I live in Thurman in the southern Adirondacks, I have no cell service at home. So I, my knowledge of cell phones is quite limited. And I have a sketchy satellite internet. But thanks to people like Emily and Mitchell and Zachary, uh, they provided the support so that I was over to, able to overcome that challenge and do some meaningful citizen science. The other aspect that intrigued me is that um, I was more familiar with the uh, areas around my home and north of here, the Northville Placid Trail, the high peaks, uh, remote pet trout ponds. Um, but I wasn't so familiar with some of the places to the south 
So I had a great opportunity to go to some new places. Um, as I said a minute ago, the uh, first surveys I did, I was uh, I wouldn't even get out of the car before I put the micro spikes on because the parking lots were uh, sheer ice. But toward the end of the survey time, I was watching wildflowers and insects. So it was a great way to see the transition from winter to spring. Um, I came armed with my topo maps and trail maps. Uh, I had never known about all trails before I got involved with this. I have a library full of guidebooks and I looked at some of them and they're 40 years old. So uh, this was a chance to update my own knowledge. I used the GPS and lots of support to uh, work with the app and uh, do the online inputs. Uh, I realized early on that as I was driving and trying to find the sites, it would be good to have a partner. So I recruited a friend who didn't know much about hemlocks, but was very enthusiastic. So she was great at, at navigating. And I think it was our first time uh, in the northern part of Moreau State Park that she said, I get it now. This is like an Easter egg hunt, except we're hoping not to find any eggs. Um, so she was a good, good companion. Um, I was able to find old places and new some places like Hadley Mountain and the Hudson River Recreation Area that I hadn't been to in years and I realized how beautiful they were. Um, the best thing though was that we didn't find any hemlock woolly adelgid. Um, I did get pretty adept at finding spider egg cases and some of the uh, adelgid lookalikes. Um, so it was a great opportunity to look up close at things, but also to enjoy some beautiful views like the Notch area in Cambridge where I had never been and the, the uh, views in Moreau Park of the Hudson River itself. Um, so in summary, um, I really feel that, that uh, hope comes from action and I I'm very have a lot of gratitude to the uh, people like Emily and her cohorts who have enabled me to be a part of this um, endeavor. So thank you very much. I'm having my own uh, technical challenges every day, Carolyn. So you're you're amazing and the work you've done is amazing. And, and also just to note like Carolyn's emails back and forth and attention to detail helped us take off roads that had seasonal closures that we didn't think of prior because it's all a huge experiment for us too. Um, helped identify bugs in our map, um, you know, on day one, helped us figure out, okay, here's better ways we can explain how to use IMAP invasives when we, we haven't even interacted with anyone physically and can't show folks. Um, so it's all been through the written word and lots of screenshots. And so thank you everybody for your patience and Carolyn for exploring not just a new area, but a whole new world of technology. And, and, you know, sometimes it's scary to be with technology, but we've found that this year it's been so helpful to still connect us. So your work has been amazing. I think that we're going to have even more fun in the fall. Um, and I can't wait to actually get out there and do surveys with other folks. So I'm there's a, an amazing amount of emails in my inbox talking to people about, nope, that's just bird poop. So thank you, Carolyn, and to all of our volunteers and to Zach and to Mitchell and to uh, Carrie from Hemlock, um, New York State Hemlock Initiative. Um, this has been a really fun project and I can't wait to see where it goes. And this is how citizen science works. So thank you. And then I will keep going and talk about some of our other really successful um, oh, here, let's hear from a SARC volunteer. Some other really successful citizen science programs that have been going on for a really long time. And that is APIP's Aquatic Volunteers and Lake Survey Volunteers, which I won't spend too much time on because I know that Brian is going to talk about this in just a bit. Um, but what was really amazing to see is that, you know, even with COVID, folks were still getting out there. So we had uh, close to 100 lakes monitored this past year by 120-ish volunteers, I think it's maybe 122. Um, and that's just really amazing. And so without the work of these volunteers, and we're hoping to maybe even include some new data collection methods this year, bring in some other programs and you know, join forces with part, community partners uh, to bolster this and their programs. This is how we know what's happening out on the landscape. The Adirondacks have over 3,000 lakes and ponds a number of different uh, riparian watersheds that if, if it weren't for 
our early detection volunteers, we wouldn't be able to monitor if something is changing, if there is, you know, some sort of transportation of invasive species, either plants or animals. And this is how we're able to, to understand, keep a pulse on what's happening in the Adirondacks. Um, and so this work is integral to knowing, you know, what our management needs to be and even what our outreach needs to be or prevention measures need to be. So this is still a wildly successful program and I'm, I'm really looking forward to getting out on the water with people this year. Last year I was inside all year. Um, so I'm really looking forward to building on the amazing work that Erin Vinny Volrath has done and working with Brian this year and working with all of you if you're on the line now or watching this later. Um, another program which was in its pilot year last year, which we're excited to keep growing this year, is the Notweeds Management Partnership. So this is a long time volunteer program started out of the inlet area, I believe starting in 2008. And the goal is to reduce the severity of high priority knotweed infestations on pi private and public land, um, because this plant won't go away, but we can help limit its spread. We can help limit its growth and we can help limit infestations. Um, so volunteers are integral to helping this happen as well, where we're just a small staff and we need that actual, um, you know, face to face, right, with COVID, I'll put that in parentheses, but connection to different landowners to find those infestations and ask for permission to treat them. Um, and so the kickoff orientation, we actually had this past Monday, which was really exciting. We were able to bring in uh, this is actually Becca's program. Becca's not able to join us today. Um, so I'm just delivering the information, but I'm helping cheerlead this program throughout the year if you're involved in this. Uh, the orientation was this past Monday, and we have a goal this year to treat 125 priority sites throughout the Adirondacks. So it's no longer just in the inlet area or just in Hamilton County. And that is a 25% increase um, goal for 20 from 2020. So I'm I Confident that we'll be able to meet that. And I'm really excited that we were able to bring in not just a number of different um, and new volunteers, but also community partners and organizations working in different act, uh, areas of the Adirondacks. And contact information for Knotweed Program. Yeah, we can send out information about the Knotweed Program um, as a follow up to this, to when we send out notes and a recording link. To the, uh, to the presentation today. Um, and there's also a page on our website under resources. You can scroll down and find everything you need to know about knotweed as a plant, management of knotweed, but then also link through to the, a description of the volunteer program itself. All right, so without further ado, I believe it is, I'm gonna give up remote control. Okay, as we're getting our technology set up, I'm just going to say good morning, everyone. This is uh, Zach Simic, the Conservation and GIS Analyst for APIP. Um, it's great to see you all. I'm going to take a few minutes to walk through a handful of slides, providing an overview of some of our forest pest uh, programs and research from this past year. I'm going to start with some information on hemlock woolly adelgid, or HWA, and then pass things over to Tamara, who will talk a little bit about our EAB, or emerald ash borer work. So just to set the stage for folks, um, unfortunately, we do have hemlock weed adelgid or HWA within our prism. It's uh, located in the southeastern corner of our region surrounding Lake George. Um, there are several established infestations. And we also have a few kind of knocking on the door of our southern border near uh, the Hudson River at Moreau Lake State Park and uh, Rockwood State Forest down here in Fulton County. Um, as of this year, um, all prisms in New York State now have confirmed infestations of hemlock woolly adelgid. Our Slilo prism to the west was our, was our last uninvaded prism, but they recently detected HWA um, in Oswego County. So it's now across all prisms in New York State. Um, but taking a closer look at the Adirondack region, this is a map showing a kind of a detailed view of where HWA is found in the region surrounding Lake George. And I won't go into incredible detail here, but just to provide some highlights um, uh, for history, uh, Hemlock Loyadelja was first found in the Adirondacks on Prospect Mountain, um, this, the western side of Lake George. Um, it was detected in July of 2017, promptly treated with insecticide and, and later deemed to be eradicated. Unfortunately, this summer, uh, multiple new infestations were found on the eastern shore of the lake 
The first was detected by a citizen scientist at the Glen Island campground, confirmed by DEC, and then subsequent surveys throughout the remainder of the summer and fall uh, found additional infestations down the eastern shore, as well as on um, the Nature Conservancy's Dome Island in the center of the lake. And more recently in uh, the winter months, our partners in the Capitol Prism found HWA uh, just south of our prism border, or APIT prism border um, at Moreau Lake State Park. So unfortunately it is here, it's established. Um, there are over 250 infested acres within our region, primarily along the Eastern shore. So it's something that we're going to have to deal with and continue to address uh, moving forward. So given these new detections, we uh, were involved in a flurry of activity, working with a variety of different partners to perform surveys across the prism, uh, looking for new infestations of HWA. And we can really kind of divide this into three efforts that worked uh, occasionally in parallel and sometimes at, at separate times. So we performed some resource-based early detection surveys. This was utilizing a professional field crew uh, led by Adirondack Research. As Emily mentioned, we also led some citizen science surveys throughout the southeastern portion of the prism and recently just wrapped up some remote sensing based um, field surveys that were once again performed by a professional field crew. And I'll just walk quickly through some of the results of each of these three efforts. So our resource based field surveys, these were based on um, sites that were selected by a consortium of partners. And we focused these surveys on areas with known um, hemlock stands in high density, as well as areas that were potentially vulnerable to HWA based on landscape characteristics. So things like proximity to water or proximity to recreational resources. So from October to November of 2020, um, multiple uh, partners performed surveys throughout the Lake George watershed so all of these points on the map represent sites that were surveyed. So we had contributions from APIP, the Capital Prism, uh, Lake George Land Conservancy, and then the bulk of the surveys were performed by Adirondack Research um, with funding provided by the Lake George Land Conservancy. So in total, over 400 sites were surveyed, and this resulted in two new detections of HWA. You've already seen these on the, the previous slide. Those were the Buck Mountain Trailhead on the eastern shore of the lake, and uh, the Nature Conservancy's Dome Island. Dome Island is currently under active management and uh, Buck Mountain is being evaluated for treatment this field season. We've also been working uh, diligently on a remote sensing project. And the goal of this effort is to utilize remote sensing data that is freely available to help us identify hemlock forests that are in decline, which could potentially be associated with HWA. So this is meant to narrow the focus of our ground survey efforts to areas that are most likely to contain HWA. Uh, the, the funding for this project has been uh, provided by the Fund for Lake George, and the modeling work is being led by Dr. Andy Reinman of the uh, City University of New York Advanced Science Research Center. And without going into too much detail about kind of the technical aspects of this project, um, just to provide kind of a high level overview, this process involves the use of freely available satellite data using a platform called Landsat. This Landsat satellite essentially collects images of the earth and we can take those images and measure different things related to vegetation. So we're using something called uh, Normalized Difference Vegetation Index or NDVI. And this is essentially just a measurement of how green vegetation is or in other words, how healthy that vegetation is. So we can use this satellite and use this indice to take multiple measurements over time to see how the health of a forest is, is changing or not changing uh, through, through a time span. So for example, if the NDVI value or the greenness of a, a portion of hemlock forest remains relatively high and stable, this is an indication that that um, tree or that forest stand is, is healthy. If we're measuring this NDVI value over time and we see that it declines rapidly, this is an indication that um, that forest has seen some type of acute or significant um, uh, decline factor. So for example, trees have blown down, they've broken, there's storm damage, they were healthy one day and dead the next. 
what we've been trying to tease out with this project are uh, portions of hemlock forests that have a gradual decline in this NDVI or greenness or health value over a time span, but it's gradual but statistically significantly different than um, kind of the average value for surrounding forests. In other words, this is something that we could potentially associate with the presence of HWA, given that we know hemlock woolly adelgid causes slow decline or mortality over time. So we wrapped up this, uh, the first phase of this modeling um, about a month ago, and we identified several hundred sites across the region, filtered those down to areas with public access and provided those to our contractor, uh, Adirondack Research, who performed uh, another round of field surveys to look for HWA and validate some of the findings of this model. And they visited over 400 sites throughout the southeastern portion of our Adirondack prism in the northern capital region. And they found essentially one new infestation of HWA in Rensselaer County in the town of Husik. This was not a big surprise given that it was uh, located in close proximity to other known infestations. So uh, takeaways here, you know, you, you might think about this map. We had 400 sites that we visited. These are all supposed to be hemlock forests in decline. You know, why did we only find HWA at one site? And the reason for that is that this decline value that we're measuring, it is not necessarily specific to HWA. It can be influenced by, by a variety of other factors, whether that be a native pest, uh, perhaps site stress, minor physical damage, and so on. So moving forward, our goal is to continue to refine this model so that we can better isolate a signal that is specific to HWA uh, to further narrow the focus of where we're going out to survey on the ground and maximize kind of the efficiency of our ground surveys. Put more to come on that. And then I just wanted to summarize. So this is putting together all three efforts. So both rounds of professional surveys as well as our citizen science surveys. And you can see the footprint of those uh, early detection efforts across the region, great coverage in that Lake George Basin and Northern Capital Region, and even some uh, surveys in way in the Northern portion of the prism, thanks to our partners up at Shattergate Lake. So in total, this was just over 975 sites, um, basically from fall of 2020 to spring of 2021. And I'll end uh, our HWA overview talking about some future treatment plans. So in the 2021 field season, we will continue um, to assist DEC partners with their management efforts on the eastern shore of Lake George by providing some APIP staff to perform applications. And we'll continue our own chemical treatments of hemlock woolly adelgid on uh, Nature Conservancy's Dilm Island in the center of the lake with the goal of that treatment being to preserve a representative population of hemlocks on the island and slow the spread of HWA to the western shore of Lake George. We expect to treat an additional 300 to 350 trees this field season. And that is the end of our HWA section. I defer to my colleagues regarding time for questions. And Zach, you can uh, hit click again if you're still controlling the screen. We have a chat question as well to come in. <clears throat> and if you stop controlling, I'll take it over for EAB. All right. As I said, everyone, today we have a fast paced agenda because we've got a lot going on. And again, thanks to a lot of conversations with you all since February, where we've been plotting out our field season. So I'm going to just take it over and talk a little bit about emerald ash borer, one of the other forest pests that we're very concerned about, and all of you are as well. Just a quick little recap. So 2020, in addition to being not a great year for uh, hemlock woolly adelgid, we had already had sightings of emerald ash borer in St. Lawrence County and in Franklin County, but then in this past summer, there were also findings in Clinton County as well as in Warren County. So there were 11 new locations. If you think of uh, our Adirondack prism going all the way up to the Canadian border and four of those in the park. So there are now only a few counties that are emerald ash borer free. So what are we doing right now thinking about emerald ash borer? I'm really excited about this monitoring and managing ash project and that's put together by the Environmental Research Institute. And what I love about this is there's a whole program across the Northeast 
trying to look for what they call lingering ash trees. These are ash trees that are, we hope, are resistant to the emerald ash borer. So you know what I like about this is we're trying not to repeat history. When chestnut blight hit the America, the then nascent US Forest Service was telling everyone to salvage every tree, cut them all down. Millions of acres of forests were cleared, trying to get all the chestnut before they were killed. But that also meant that any sort of inherent diversity that might have shown resistance to that disease was also lost. So here, you know, I think there's this real hope that nature might hold the key for us if there are lingering ash out there. And so there are different citizen science projects. You can go more to the monitoring ash project to learn about ways that you can get involved. What APIP's going to be doing this year is working on the monitoring plot network. So we're trying to scope out some sites that have at least 40 mature ash trees and, you know, on a reasonable sized plot where we can actually go monitor those every year. And what we're looking for is you, the part of this is that you're not allowed to cut them down. You've got to let them, if they are infested, die naturally, but be looking for those trees that might have genetic resistance. And with those, that's the trees that we hope that we can get into some breeding programs to try and help breed resistance, which has been somewhat successful with some of the hemlocks where they've been crossing them. I and mean, we're not with the hemlocks, but with the chestnuts, with some of the Chinese chestnuts to try and breed that resistance. So what we'll be doing for emerald ash borer this summer is we hope to be expanding our surveys, trying to figure out how far those sites in Warren County have spread. And we'll be looking and placing traps. You might see some of those purple or green sticky traps out there. We're also, Emily Bell's gonna talk a little bit in a minute, but you know, really the most important thing any of us can do on the phone is just stop the transport of firewood. You know, I, I sort of live in fear this summer that people will be taking ash firewood from that Warren County area and bringing it into the heart of the Adirondacks into our areas that so far are emerald ash borer free. If I leave you with one message, please don't move firewood. Don't let your friends move firewood. And we'll be establishing these plots. Now, one interesting thing is that most of the research is on white ash and green ash because it's pretty easy, no, relatively easy to find as compared to black ash. But many of you know that that black ash is used by a lot of our Native American neighbors for ash basketry and for Native crafts. And it's really hard to find a black ash stand that we can monitor. So if any of you know of black ash that are near you, or you think you've got it, take a few photos, send them to me and to Becca, and we're looking for some black ash stands that we can hopefully monitor as part of this program as well. And as I said, we were going to be fast and furious this summer, this today, and I'm going to let Ryan take control to talk about our aquatic program this summer. Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, yes, as you can see, all sorts of interesting types of surveys going out there. And one of the key things that you'll hear again and again is that we need your help. So um, as APIP, we are a partnership organization. And so we depend on the great work that all our partners and volunteers and citizen science tests all across the over six, seven million acres of our prism. Um, so super important. So when we think about our aquatic invasive species um, surveys for the different lakes, there are thousands of lakes all across the region. And what we really need is a, is a combination. Um, so we use our early detection rapid response as our professional crew that we hire. Uh, we have our volunteers that are spread all across the, the region. And then um, our own AP staff and partners go out and you know this is one of the you know the sum is greater than individual parts and so by everybody working together we can be able to have a better management of our lakes um, so this is looking back at our 2020 lakes that were surveyed uh, we had 106 lakes in, in total and we have this uh, pretty good division between our three-legged stool of, of volunteers um, and our early early detection rapid response team. Um, so it breaks out with 
actually, the EDRR crew is is the highest with 41, about 39%. But you know, volunteers uh, take up 31%, uh, percent, and then our staff and partners uh, cover the remaining 30%. So it is a great team effort. So you know, our volunteers are these uh, very passionate and you know dedicated people. They are really care about their 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 local lakes. They are great uh, local ambassadors. It's not just about being our eyes and ears out on um, the lakes. They're also our our mouthpieces. They talk to their their neighbors. They talk to their friends. They get to say like, hey, this lake really matters, and we're trying to keep it clean and clear of invasive species. So uh, they are a gr very effective. They have a, this broad geographic reach, and we are will be holding another virtual training on June thirtieth. So we would love uh, for any returning volunteers to come back if you feel you want to brush up on any of your skills of plant identification or about the process of recording it on um, on IMAP or if you know of any new people who would like to come and join the program. So that'll be June 30th and you'll see updates on our website. Uh, this is a list of the lakes that we uh, the volunteers surveyed in in 2020. Um, one important thing I'd like to point out with some of these bigger lakes, um, you know, like Sacandagua, you can see on there, um, or even like Lake Placid, you know, um, even doing a partial uh, survey, you know, a survey of a bay or a survey of an area near your home, it, it's, it's helpful. Having, having any information is better than having no information. So we hope to have these, these uh, same lakes will be monitored again this year, along with adding um, a couple new ones. Uh, you've heard this mentioned, but we have an aquatic early detection and rapid response crew. Um, this is the picture of the 2020 uh, field summer field crew. So it is a crew of generally around uh, four people uh, from Adirondack Research that go out for over 12 uh, weeks. Uh, we have a goal to survey around 40 to, to 45 lakes, depending on uh, the conditions and um, the size. Uh, of the lakes. And so these are professional crew that we uh, are very well trained and they're able to go out there and go to high priority areas um, that maybe volunteers or other partners cannot get to. Uh, we use them on a rotational basis. So in 2021, they will be returning to uh, region one. So the southeastern portion of uh, the prism. Um, this will be a region that they will they surveyed in 2018, so they'll be going back to it. And uh, we'll be able to check on some of the same lakes, but also get a lot of new lakes. And they use our IPMS, our uh, invasive plant mobile monitoring system for delineating beds of aquatic invasive species like Eurasian water milfoil. Um, they do plankton toes. Uh, they do uh, uh, sieve seeds for uh, Asian clams. And they also do um, some biobasing, which is uses a sonar to help uh, map uh, the bottom of the lake. So giving us information on hardness, bio volume, how much plants are in the water column and uh, the bathymetry, the depth of the lake. So this is important data that we hopefully will be able to use for better modeling of the region. So um, if you wanted to use the chat, we would uh, be very interested to hear about if you have any suggestions. Right now we are building the priority uh, lake list for the region one. So if there are areas that uh, lakes or reservoirs that you think should be monitored, you can put them in the chat or follow up with us um, after the time uh, after this presentation. And here's an example of one of the um, types of final products that the uh, EDRR crew produces. And so this is a map of Lake Flower and Saranac Lake. And so you, you can see the, the green colors come from the, the bio volume data from BioBase. And then the, the reds are the invasive plant beds that are mapped in our IPMS um, software. So we're able to get very fine grain data about where invasive plants are in these lakes. And as you can see, they are on our uh, on our website, so you can go and see the ones um, from the past years. Any questions that anyone has?
I'm not seeing any questions in the chat, but we would love to hear from you again. I know it was a fast paced meeting this, this morning, um, but really if you are out planning to survey any lakes this summer, or you have suggestions of places where Adirondack Research's team should go in region one, please let us know. Oh, good, thanks, Marcus. Super. Well, I think I'm back up to bat. Uh, we have a really small baseball team. Um, so I just want to no make one note that I know Tamara put in the chat and I got a little flustered with, with technology when I started talking about volunteer programs earlier. If any of your organizations have volunteer opportunities or need help with recruitment for this spring, summer, fall, please let us know and we can always share that information out on our listserv to help bolster your programs as well. So we're here to help get that information out to the public. And so I am overjoyed to share this next section with you. I'm like jumping out of my seat. So in, in the past partner workshops in this past February, now the dog is howling. Um, we talked to you all in those two meetings, the terrestrial meeting and the aquatic meeting that we have a program goal and need to change up, increase and grow our targeted prevention information to get out to the, to, to the public, particularly um, all the new users and new recreationalists who are coming up to the Adirondacks because it's a world-class, gorgeous, wonderful preserved area. Um, and people are discovering more what's in their own state, in their neighboring state, in their own backyard. And so we really wanna get the best information out to folks um, in an effective, fun way that's really welcoming. Um, Tamara pointed out a really, really, really important aspect of that is even reminding people not to move firewood, right? So a lot of these messages some of us have heard for 20 years, um, but it needs to be refreshed and reminded. So I'm going to preview with you all after, you know, checking in on design goals, what we've got in store. And we would, we have an interactive section here where we need some of your help to talk about or to gather information on um, numbers that your organization can help um, get out to your communities. So if you are a lake association, if you're a local nonprofit, if you're a local volunteer, if you're just involved in your community garden. Um, so Tamara put a, a link to a Microsoft form that should be open to everybody that'll just take you a minute um, to fill out. So I'd love to harvest that info from you and I'll be able to uh, track you down later, but we also are gonna have an ordering form on our website on adkinvasives.com. Um, our goal is to have that available and open and ready for you by Invasive Species Awareness Week 2021, which begins on June 6th. So without further ado, I'm gonna go through and show you, of course, it's not working. Okay. So the first thing I have available and that we're gonna have available are two posters that we've been developing, one for terrestrial topics, one for aquatic topics. Um, you know, lots of different tips and tricks of what to know when you go out into the Adirondacks to hike or bike or ride your horse or just to have a campfire with your family or what you need to know if you're fishing or boating or stand up paddle boarding. Um, when you come and visit the Adirondacks. So a lot of these, um, we've engaged partners um, to know how to drive them to different resources people should know about as well. So once you really take a look at these, you'll see that we're trying to drive people to the um, Adirondack Watershed Institute resources to know where boat wash stations are and um, boat inspection stations are throughout the Adirondacks or even for the don'tmovefirewood.org campaign, which is a uh, actually North American wide campaign of the Nature Conservancy. So these are not final yet, but they will be finalized soon and will be ready and available for free for you to order so that we can get these out into the world, every visitor center, every boat launch, you know, outdoor gear shops, and um, in a friendly way, connect people to what they need to know to be awesome stewards of the land around them and have a really great time while they're up here. So these are gonna be 11 by 17 and very glossy, 
<laughs> um, so we've got posters. And then following that, we've also got, so it's two posters. We're gonna have two brochures as well. So following that aquatic, what you need to know in the water, what you need to know on land. We'll have two fourfold brochures. Um, so introducing people to what invasive species are and why we should care about them. Um, there's, there's going to be a, a diagram here, a refresh diagram of how to wash your boat correctly and where to pay attention. Um, and then these are not plugged in yet, but you can see it a little bit better on the terrestrial poster. They're going to have key species to be on the lookout for. And we're also going to, with this, these QR codes, drive people to our website. And we're going to be developing new clear resource pages on our website to get people to go and understand exactly where the boat wash stations are in the Adirondacks, to go and know exactly what IMAP invasives is and why you should use it and how you should use it. And then go to the Don't Move Firewood campaign made website, which actually has maps of where to buy certified um, heat treated firewood that is certified to be pest free. We're also gonna have increased information on these brochures about using and buying local certified bait, um, which uh, especially as I dig in to be the world's worst fisherman, um, I'm realizing that there needs to be a lot more information out there. And if you see me opening worm coolers throughout the Adirondacks this summer to inspect worms, um, please don't, don't interrupt me. I'm, I'm happy, I'm doing my thing. Um, so we're gonna increase information about bait throughout the Adirondacks too. All right, so we have these two brochures. And then lastly, we're working with the Nature Conservancy's Don't Move Firewood campaign to actually customize. You may have seen some of these materials in the past, but um, this is actually, uh, they have the ability to really customize it for different regions. So like if you're in Colorado, Colorado has their specific uh, flyers and Oregon has their specific flyers and Vermont has their specific flyers. So we're making sure to have these materials ready for the Adirondacks to know what you need to do in the Adirondacks. And actually, thanks to Gwendolyn Craig, who I think is on the line today, we have this really awesome photo of two lady foresters, so Tamara and Becca at work, inspecting uh, the ash outbreak that was identified on the Scroon River. Um, and so we're really, really pushing this don't move firewood message across the Adirondacks really plugging into all these recreational opportunities and what people need to know because they're coming here to recreate. We live here because we love recreating. Um, and we, we live here because we love trees and people visit because they love trees. So what do people need to know? Um, and so as Tamara said, oh, we're also gonna have tote bags. Thank you to the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation for don't move firewood tote bags. They're very cute. Um, so what we really need to know though is how many do I need to order? <laughs> and I will know how many I need to order by also checking in with you all as our partners um, of, you know, how many marinas do you think you can get out there to, to hit? Or are, is there a private campground near you that you can, you know, bring materials to or other businesses, or maybe you own a business yourself, or if you're a nonprofit, you have a network of visitor centers or trailheads of, on your own. Um, and so this, this poll, we won't hold you to it, but it will give me a ballpark number um, and the logistics of just how to budget for, for what I need to tell our, our printer. Um, and so if you're interested in posters, how many posters would you estimate you would need um, from those two I had there or brochures or and or brochures, how many do you think you need? And we just have that in the chat right here. And um, especially if you're you know working in the environmental sector, and it's spring and it's really busy. I will have an order form later, but if you can't get to it, this will help me track you down and say, hey, friends at this organization, can I bring you these or something? So on and so forth. So I wanna thank you all for, you know, helping develop these, in, these materials, um, helping troubleshoot, um, helping, you know, even edit. And I'm really excited to get this information out there. And then I think, I think I went a little fast because I'm a fast talker, but we might have some room for questions at the moment. Or no, I'm sorry, it's, it's Tamara's turn. All right, 
Well, actually, we do have about five minutes or so for questions on any topic. I've been taking some good notes as we go along here today. Um, please make sure you post any volunteer opportunities you have for people. Thanks for the one tip on black ash. And also, if you're going to be involved in any forest pest work this summer, we'd love to know about that. And we'll be able to connect and follow up with you. Region 1 aquatic surveys. Um, this is our last formally scheduled partner meeting until the fall, but I know that we did hold some partner roundtables in February. If you're interested in having those again sometime before the field season really gets underway, we're happy to coordinate some of those. So take a couple of minutes for questions before we take a break. There was one question and something I left out. Um, our aim is to have these available to order um, by ISA. So the week, first week, full week of June, June 6th, we'll have this up on our website. And so folks can start ordering them from me. If you've been to the Play Clean Go website, um, we can get you, it, it'll be pretty easy. We'll send it out via our listserv and I'll post it on our social media. But then we're hoping to have materials to you in hand by the 4th of July, um, so that when a lot of the visitors come up, you'll have all that info. And then Jackie, did you have a hand up? Yeah, I was just gonna ask, I would like to bring this uh, form back to folks at my organization. So it's something like we can get back by, but it sounds like there's a little bit of time. We've got a couple weeks. Um, I'm trying to get materials to our printer by about May 21st. So if, if you wanted to bring it back and, and see what you need, um, there's time. That's great, thank you. Thanks for asking. Yeah, and feel free to jump off mute if you have any quick updates you want to share. We will take a break in about five minutes and then reconvene at 1045 for our feature presentation. Um, but again, jump off mute if you have updates that you want to share or you need to connect with any of the other 40 or so people who are on the call today. I will stay on the call a little bit, Brian. If you can go to the next slide, that would be great. Super. Um, I, as I said, we were going to go fast and furious this morning. I am really delighted to have our speakers joining us at 1045 for our feature presentation on environmental DNA. And so if you want to take a little break, uh, refresh your cup of coffee please come back right at 1045. And again, I'll stay on the line a little bit if anybody's got questions or just wants to chat. 